you're going to get heart disease, cancer, or a neurodegenerative disease. Over your lifetime, people are going to get that. Dr. Brett Scher, a board-certified cardiologist and lipidologist. He is a lecturer, podcaster, business owner. He is now the medical director of Metabolic Mind. Which funds nutrition research and education. How would people know I'm on a trajectory for heart disease or I'm not? High-fat diets cause heart disease. Yes, that's going to harm your body, your cardiovascular health, your endocrine system, your risk for cancer, and it's going to harm your brain. Food companies hire brilliant scientists to get the exact amount of sweetness, not too sweet. Sweet, but make sure it's sweet enough to get the right amount of crunch and mouthfeel and to design these foods to make you want more. They're scientifically designed to make you want more. You're going to get heart attacks. There's no question about it. They're wrecking their thyroids and their hormones and losing their hair, but boom. If you could just start there, you're going to make dramatic improvements in your health. All right, Dr. Brett, I know that People don't just get heart disease from doing one wrong thing, and that it usually comes from an accumulation of doing many bad habits, whether that be smoking and not exercising and drinking alcohol and eating the wrong kinds of foods and having a lot of stress, that there's lots of different factors that go into why someone eventually may have a cardiac event. But at the same time, telling people they have to change all of their habits and completely change their lifestyle might also be very overwhelming. So if there was just one thing that people could start doing tomorrow that could start improving their cardiac health, what would that one thing be that you think would be making the biggest impact on reducing someone's risk for a cardiac event? Well, that one thing would be optimize your metabolic health. Now, unfortunately, that can mean doing many different things. But if you had to start one thing, I guess I would say start lifting weights. And it doesn't mean you have to lift heavy, but do some resistant exercise, build up some muscle. Because as a society... We are metabolically unhealthy and we are sarcopenic. We don't have enough muscle and we have too much fat. So if we can start building up muscle. Muscle is more metabolically active than fat. It's going to burn glucose better. It doesn't require insulin. So it can help improve your metabolic health. Now, if that's all you do, though, it's probably not going to be enough but I think it's a great starting point. But then from there, if you can eat whole foods, right? Just don't eat anything that's processed or packaged or refined. And that includes oils, that includes, you know, the carbs and the crackers and all that stuff. Just eat meats, eggs, vegetables, fruit, boom. If you could just start there, whole foods and lift weights, my goodness, you're going to make dramatic improvements in your health. Absolutely. You know, I think sometimes we overcomplicate it. Wait, am I supposed to do keto? Wait, carnivore? No, vegan? No, vegetarian? Which one is it? And it's like, you know, if you just eat whole foods, you're going to be stepping in the right direction. And you might be able to then pinpoint and find, oh, you know what? When I have fruit, it causes me to binge eat on other processed foods. Oh, when I have vegetables, it causes me to have a skin flare up. Everyone's going to be a little bit different. But if you start with the baseline of whole foods, then you can t- teeter and, and cater towards your preferences on what's making you most optimal. I think often when people first think about what causes heart disease, they will turn towards fat or sugar. Why is it that so many doctors believe that a high fat diet is unhealthy? Yeah, you know, this is the unfortunate thing about health, nutrition, and science is that the quality of evidence that we have linking a certain type of food or a certain type of diet to either good or bad health is incredibly weak evidence. So it is quote unquote common knowledge in medicine that high fat diets cause heart disease. And that is completely not true. Like that statement I just said is completely false, but it's believed to be true because you get these studies of, you know, tens of thousands of people living their life and you ask them to report what they ate and then you follow them. Oh, you ask them to report maybe once or twice in a 20 year period what they ate. And then you follow them over that 20 year period and see who lived, who died, who had heart attacks, who had diabetes, whatever. And you just crunch the data and you say, oh, look, people who eat more fat got more heart attacks. Therefore, fat causes heart attacks. But that's not how science works. That is like a travesty of science. But yet that's the level of evidence that is being relied upon to say fat causes heart disease. Now, in reality, if you are eating a high carb, high fat, high calorie diet and smoking and drinking and not, you know, not being healthy, yeah, you're going to get heart attacks. There's no question about it. But how can you point to the fat as being the one thing? No, you can't. And same thing for, you know, red meat is bad for you. Well, you know, the studies, you look at the studies where people ate more red meat or ate more fat, and they also ate more calories. They also smoked more. They also exercised less. 
they were less healthy in general. And that's almost across the board for any of those studies. So it's there's no way you can say that if you are following a whole foods, low carb diet, where you're eating plenty of fat and red meat, and you're, you know, you're improving your metabolic health and in a healthy weight, not overeating calories. How can you say that that situation has anything to do with that body of evidence? Because it doesn't, it's completely different, but it's just so much easier to sort of lump it all together. And, and that's the unfortunate part of medicine right now when it comes to nutrition and health. I can't help but wonder sometimes too, when people say a high fat diet is bad for the heart, like what kind of fat are we talking about? Because mm -hmm. if our, if we're pouring canola oil all over the chicken, yeah, well then that's probably not gonna be the best thing for your heart health. Do you think that vegetable oils, seed oils are a worse form of fat? Or, or do you think that they're potato, potato, you eat butter, you eat canola oil, it's the same thing? I, you know, the whole debate about seed oils just really frustrates me because the only reason we're talking about seed oils is because there's this fear of, butter and ghee and, you know, and saturated fat, which there shouldn't be. Like there's no reason to eat seed oils because there's nothing wrong with eating natural saturated fats. So the whole debate just, I mean, they, it's, it's just a food like product that shouldn't exist. It's ultra processed. It's pointless calories that are, you know, refined and potentially oxidized. Can I say that seed oils contribute to heart disease? No, I don't know that we have strong evidence to say that, but then I would also say, who cares? You shouldn't be eating them anyway. <laughs> like if you're gonna stick to whole foods, minimally processed, then seed oils have no place in a, in a, in a diet like that. So I don't know, for me, it's just frustrating. We shouldn't even be discussing them. They shouldn't even exist. We should just be eating, you know, you could say uh, uh, avocado oil and olive oil are processed. Well, yeah, but compared to seed oils, they're minimally processed compared to seed oils. Seed oils are highly processed, but yeah, butter and ghee and lard and like eat that, eat that. And that's the irony is because you're supposed to say that butter and ghee and lard and steak and all these things are supposed to be bad for your heart, egg yolks. Um, so if you had said then the thing that people could do to start reducing their risk of heart disease is to improve their metabolic health. And I'm thinking one of those things is to revolving around food and you said eat whole foods, not processed foods. So what's the thing in processed foods then that you think is contributing to people having poor metabolic health if you're saying it might not even be vegetable and seed oils? Yeah. So the, the thing about processed foods is it sort of, I guess one way you can look at it is, is it, it bypasses our regulatory system, right? Our regulatory system kind of says we need protein, we need nutrition, and we need energy. Okay. Now the highly processed foods gives you plenty of energy in the form of calories, but not necessarily useful energy, but gives you plenty of energy without the protein and the nutrition that our body needs. So you keep eating more and more calories, more and more energy without getting the stuff you actually need. So you're getting too much and the wrong kinds and our, it overwhelms our body system. But if we switch to the natural foods, you're getting the nutrition and the protein that comes with those foods without as many calories and that our metabolic system can handle and function well. With. So it, that, I think that's the main problem. It just sort of bypasses that system. Okay, so you don't think there's a specific ingredient or additive in processed foods that's contributing to heart disease. You just think that there's the lack of nutrition that's contributing to people having poor metabolic health that leads to heart disease. Well, so yes and no. I think that is the kind of understandable, like hard to argue with. Everybody can understand that point and is pretty well proven that if you're eating the, the highly processed foods, you're going to eat more of them. You're not going to get any, you're not going to get much nutrition, certainly low nutrition per calorie. Now, the other part is, are they pro-inflammatory? Do they cause a, you know, a chronic oxidative state? I think the answer there is probably, um, maybe the evidence in humans isn't quite as strong there, but I think there's, but I do think that's definitely a concern. Yeah, for sure. So, so far you haven't even said anything about sugar it being like that they added sugars in the processed foods or, okay. So that's part of it. That's part of the energy and the calories without nutrition, right? Because So even if ultra processed foods like um, seed oils don't have sugar in them, I still think there's a potential problem with them, but then you add the sugar on top. I mean, you know, I remember back in my podcast, I, I interviewed Michael Moss who, who, wrote books about ultra processed food industry. And he talks, you know, he has so such detailed knowledge about the scientists, the brilliant scientists that they hire to work for these food companies to get the exact amount of 
sweetness and not too sweet, but make sure it's sweet enough to get the right amount of crunch and mouthfeel and to design these foods to make you want more. They're scientifically designed to make you want more. So yeah, sugar definitely plays a role in that as do so many other things to get you to eat more and more and more. But what they don't do is give you any nutrition or any protein or help you feel full or improve your metabolic health. They certainly don't do that. So I just want to keep driving home this root cause of like metabolic health. And what does that mean to people? Is there a blood market they're supposed to be looking at? Is there a waist to height ratio? Is, how would people know like, okay, I'm on a trajectory for heart disease or I'm not because I'm metabolically healthy or not? Doesn't that seem kind of subjective or what, how would they know if they're metabolically healthy? Yeah. Well, so the easiest one you already mentioned is, is the waist to height ratio, which is fairly well validated in the literature. And you just measure your waist circumference and you measure your height and you divide your waist by your height, and you're looking for basically around 0.5, right? You want to be lower is better. It's a, you know, you could say it's a crude marker, but it's a marker. Now, better is if you could get blood tests, you know, your insulin level, your triglyceride level, um, your triglyceride to HDL ratio, your triglyceride um, and glucose. There are a number of different things you can, you can check. I think if you're going to check one blood test, it's probably a fasting insulin level, but Waist to height ratio is sort of the easiest because you don't even need a blood test. Fasting insulin um, is probably the best blood test to get. Um, but like I said, there are others as well. So what's the fasting insulin number you're looking for that people should be below? Well, ideally you, want, you probably want to be below eight. I think most people are, you know, in this country, in this world are not going to be below eight. Um, so I, there, I think it's good to get your baseline marker and then just make improvements upon it, follow it, see what you can do with your lifestyle to improve things and follow it over time. Lower is better from a metabolic health standpoint. Yeah. And then you should be looking at your triglyceride to HDL ratio, right? That's another one. I like to see it below one, but generally below 1.5 is still considered pretty good. Again, most people in this country are not going to be there. So moving towards that goal is, is, is a good, is a good thing to do. In the ketogenic space, people will say, oh, you know, your LDL may be high. You know, you could ignore that if your other markers are showing that you're metabolically healthy. But is is there a point where LDL is too high or total cholesterol is too high? Yeah. Um, so the answer is yes, but it's individual for each person, right? I can't tell you, you know, there's a magic cutoff in cardiology of 190. Anybody of 190 needs to be treated with a statin. No, no, we can't just say that, right? It's so individualized. I guess the answer is yes, there's a point for each person that is too high, but I can't tell you what that is. You know, for some, it might be 70, for some, it might be 300, I, you know, everybody's different. So but the one thing I would not say, the one thing that really does bother me is people say LDL is worthless as a marker and should not be paid attention to. Like, no, it's, it is one of the markers. It should be used along with ApoB and along with all these other markers. It shouldn't be elevated as the one and only marker, which unfortunately I think happens too often, but it should be put in its place as one marker, which is less important, I think, than metabolic health, but yet still could be important, especially for someone who's already has plaque or somebody who's already had an event, right? Then it takes on much more importance than someone who has a calcium score of zero. Like we have pretty good evidence that if your LDL is very high, but you have a calcium score of zero, your event rate is still low. Um, so for that person, their LDL might mean something very different than for someone who has an elevated calcium score. And certainly if you can get a, what's called a CT angiogram, which is even a more detailed test than a calcium score, where you can actually see inside the vessel and see if there's any plaque. I mean, if that's normal, then whatever your LDL is, it's not hurting you at this point. So, you know, that's a pretty good sign. We can do better than just guess now. We have all these great tests that we can do better than just guess. Okay, because I was going to ask, you had said somebody's LDL being high at 70 might be too high for them, but somebody else could be 300 and that might be their threshold. But then that would be confusing for people who go to their doctor. The doctor says, oh, you're 120, therefore here's your statin. And then they're like, well, yep. maybe I need a statin, maybe I don't. How do I actually right. know? Right. And that's that's the difference of treating people as individuals or treating people according to some published guideline, which thinks everybody's the same. Like I said, their data exists that if you have a calcium score of zero, there's this one study out of Walter Reed Medical Center that showed if you had a calcium score of zero and you got a statin or didn't get a statin for the next 10 years, there was absolutely no difference in heart attacks or who lived or died. Whereas if the calcium score was 400, there was a significant difference in those two curves over 10 years. But if your calcium score is zero, no difference. So you know, if someone, if a doctor is going to put you on a medication just because of a blood test, 
it's worth asking is, are there other tests we could do that could better refine my risk and see if I'm really going to benefit from this from this medication? And I think that's a perfectly reasonable question. Say, what about me as an individual? How can we better define my individual risk and see what my individual risk benefit ratio is for this medication? Later on, Dr. Brett and I talk about the role that sleep and stress play on our cortisol levels, insulin sensitivity, and weight management. And you'll hear me say that I look like a lean, healthy person. I'm eating a nutrient-rich whole foods diet. I'm exercising. I'm doing all of the good, healthy things, but my blood test markers show, and even if I didn't get my blood test, I could have told you this, my cortisol is high. Me and stress are like best friends, and I've been trying to sever my relationship with stress by doing things like breathing, kind of stretching, journaling, taking baths, massages, and all these things have helped me reduce my stress. But one thing that's been a huge game changer for me has been getting in my new sauna blanket for 30 minutes as part of my nighttime routine. And wow, it has been relaxing me, making my body feel like jello. And afterwards, I've been falling asleep like a baby. Infrared saunas can also be another tool to help with metabolic health and weight loss, as when using an infrared sauna blanket, your body temperature rises, making the body have to work harder to cool itself down. And this process can result in an increased heart rate, similar to moderate exercise, helping boost metabolism, increase blood flow, improve circulation, and burn calories. One day, my husband and I would like to have a full-blown infrared sauna, but you know those are quite expensive. So right now, we've just been taking turns using the sauna blanket, which is super easy to clean and can be easily packed up and put away when we don't want it in our living space. You will find a link in the description to Bond Charge's website where you can get 15% off Bond Charge's sauna blanket and all of Bond Charge's other sleep tools using discount code LILY for that 15% off at checkout. As far as you talking about, again, butter, ghee, tallow, those things are higher in saturated fat. People are gonna think that saturated fat's gonna be highly associated with heart disease as well. Now, I personally think that, sure, of course, just like we, with LDL, there is a threshold on how much saturated fat is gonna be too high, just like there's a such thing as having too much LDL or having too much sugar for each individual person. I think there is such thing as too much. I've heard people like Stan Efferdeen, Thomas DeLaller, maybe even Rhonda Patrick, drive home that they really wanna keep their saturated fat intake lower because of things that they've been seeing in studies recently that are saying, yeah, you wanna do a lower saturated fat diet. So even if you're gonna do more of a meat heavy diet, you wanna go towards the leaner meats like bison and elk and venison, and then not be adding on the butter and the ghee and the tallow. What do you think about that? Well, first, I guess there is one concept is is saturated fat or fat in general, just like free, right? Can you have as much as you want? And like you're saying, not necessarily. I mean, it, I think it serves its purpose. You cook with it, you use it to flavor your food, but it's not like it's a health food that you should be trying to eat more of purposely, right? Use it for its purpose. Don't avoid it, but use it for its purpose. Now, I have not seen any evidence within a low carb diet that eating too much saturated fat is harmful. What I have seen is people who don't care how much saturated fat they eat, they reverse their type 2 diabetes. They, you know, they normalize their blood pressure. Um, they feel fantastic, right? They, they, this is a diet that can get you to those goals. doesn't mean it works for everybody, but I have no problem with people eating a, a diet where they don't really care how much they limit their saturated fat. But like I started with, the corollary is it's not a health food that you just want to eat more and more of. You eat it for its purpose. So uh, I'm having a ribeye tonight. You know, there's plenty of saturated fat in that, but I'm having it with grilled broccoli and or, or some um, roasted broccoli and cauliflower and zucchini and a little bit of avocado. And that's my meal, right? There's nothing unhealthy in my mind about that meal, even though some might say it's high in saturated fat. Now, if I was having that ribeye with a bunch of rice and a baked potato with, uh, you know, a bunch of sour cream and more butter on it. And then I was having a dessert with a pie with saturated fat in the pie and you know a whole bunch of sugar in it. That meal is unhealthy for a number of reasons. And you can look at it for a couple of different ways. Like your body needs to do something with the fat, with the saturated fat, whether it's polyunsaturated or saturated fat, it needs to do something with it. And if you're just full of carbs and sugar and your body's burning that, then it has to store all the fat somewhere. We'll reverse that where your body's burning fat for fuel instead, and you're going to burn it and not store it. Those are two completely different physiologic situations. 
So we shouldn't be conflating them and treating them like they're the same. So do you think then that someone should be either a carb burner or a fat burner and having a little bit of something in between is not as optimal? So I'll give you an example of what I personally eat in terms of like carbohydrate intake. I'm, well, I'm technically lower carbs. I'm under 100, but I'm not in ketosis. I'm probably at like 75 grams of carbs. So then people would mm -hmm. say, oh, well, you're not becoming proficient at either burning fat or burning carbs. You're kind of right in the middle. I mean, I think I'm probably still burning well, I eat a, a quite a bit of protein. So I don't think even if I was had yeah. no carb, I'd probably be too high protein. Yeah. Well, I think, so that's an interesting concept is, is fat burning. You're either in it or you're not metabolically healthy. People can switch back and forth. Now, someone who has type two diabetes, who has severe metabolic dysfunction, they're not going to be able to do that as well. So for someone like that, then I wouldn't recommend that kind of diet. I would recommend that you stay in more of a ketogenic state on a regular basis to improve that metabolic health so that you are burning your fat. But for someone who's more better, metabolically healthy, switching back and forth seems perfectly fine. So if there was a hundred people in a room, what percentage of people do you think would be doing it that you would suggest do a ketogenic diet? Because if we're thinking about people who are going to want to improve their metabolic health, that might be a higher percentage. Yeah. You know, if you take a, a random sampling of America or even any industrialized country, I guess, it'd probably be 70% would likely benefit from starting it. Now, does that mean they have to be on it forever? No, because some people are going to dramatically improve their metabolic health and become metabolically flexible. And then they can go to a more whole foods, higher, higher carb, but still, you know, hundred grams of carbs or something like that. 75 grams of carbs. Yeah. That's not a ketogenic diet for most people. But once your metabolic health is improved, you, most people can, can transition to that kind of diet. Now, if you're using ketosis to treat a medical condition like epilepsy, like dementia, like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or whatever the case may be, if you're using a ketogenic intervention and a ketogenic diet as therapy for that, then all of a sudden it's a little bit different and you probably should stay on a ketogenic diet with medical supervision rather than trying to cycle back and forth. But if you're just talking about metabolic health, once that is significantly improved, and if you can combine it with exercise and stress management and you know good sleep hygiene, then you're more likely to be able to flip back and forth. Why would somebody want to move back into having more carbs if they find that a ketogenic diet helped improve their health? If we're saying, hey, that's a healthy diet to get healthy, why would someone not just wanna do that for the rest of their life? Great question. <laughs> I have no problem with someone doing it for the rest of their life, but our society is not one where that makes it easy to do that. So people say, oh, I miss, you know, I miss this food. I miss being able to go out and just not worry about it and think about it. I mean, there's a couple of different subsets of the population, right? Some of the population is, I feel fantastic in ketosis. It's done so many great things to my health. I'm never changing. Why, why would I ever want to change? Then there's a group that says, yeah, I really felt better in ketosis, but I really miss so many other things. And so I want to change. And then there are the people who just can't even sort of try it or, or get around the psychological burden of like, fat is bad. I need my whole grains. You know, this is an unhealthy diet. Why would I even try it? There's like a certain population that won't even try it. So, and look, everybody's got to find out what works for them. That one group that can't even try ketosis they can still improve their metabolic health. You don't need to be in ketosis to improve your metabolic health. Again, if you can just shift more towards a whole foods diet and, and exercise and you know have good sleep hygiene, you can significantly improve your metabolic health. I just think the quickest and most efficient way to get there is with a ketogenic diet along with those other lifestyle factors. So yeah, I mean, if you're feeling, if someone's feeling great with it and their health is improving in all facets, then absolutely stick with it. And that's what I was going to say too, as far as like somebody doesn't have to do a ketogenic diet to lose weight and improve their insulin sensitivity and become more metabolically healthy. And I think that the best diet that people could do to improve their health is whatever diet they're going to be able to, it's tough because I have to say without processed foods, but in general, whatever diet you're going to do that you're going to stick to for a lifetime that is going to keep you at a healthy weight and keep you being able to lift and build muscle. And so if that yeah. diet is more plant-based, if it's higher carb, whatever diet that is, that's going to keep you at a healthy weight, do that diet. But at the yeah. same time, exactly. Like, look, you know what? So at, at our metabolic mind YouTube page, where we're kind of frequently posting videos about ketogenic diets, ketogenic therapies, 
and without fail in the comments, someone's going to say, well, I went on a whole food plant-based diet and that helped my depression. I went on a whole food plant-based diet and reversed my type two diabetes. That's great. Like just because I'm talking about how ketosis can help a medical condition doesn't mean I'm negating anybody's experience with a whole food plant-based diet. Like that can work for a lot of people and that's perfectly fine. It's just doesn't mean it's right for everyone. Like there was that, there was a recent study, the Stanford twin study, just to describe it. It was basically a twins randomized to either a vegan diet or an omnivore diet. At the end, in the end of the study, they said, you know, who will continue on the diet? Only one vegan out of the whole group, out of like 20 of them, only one person on the vegan diet said they were going to continue it. So for that one person, maybe it is the right diet. But for the rest of the group, it's clearly not the right diet because they weren't going to stay on it regardless. So like you're saying, you got to find the diet that's right for each person. Somebody's a ketogenic diet is not going to be right for somebody. Although, by the way, I should say a ketogenic diet can be vegan, can be vegetarian, can be carnivore, omnivore, Mediterranean, right? Ketosis is a physiologic state, not a diet. So it, it can take any of those forms. Um, but some people, even a, someone who's eating vegan or vegetarian may not want to eat that much fat and that's fine. So it's not the right diet for them. Um, but there's still other ways they can improve their metabolic health. And like you had said about people eating a ketogenic diet and doing it for a lifetime and why people don't do that, you said that oftentimes it's because of social pressures and just the way our society is set up that we wouldn't continue doing keto forever. I also think that that's the reason right there, because some people think, well, it's because it's going to in the long run hurt your hormones, hurt your thyroid. I would think the, re the thing that hurts your hormones and hurts your thyroid is not eating enough. And oftentimes people, when they eat lots of, pro well, not that you're eating lots of protein on a ketogenic diet, but when you're eating more nutrient rich foods and you're having more fats, you might just feel so satiated and full that you naturally tend to under eat that now, yes, maybe you run into things where you're losing your hair and your menstrual cycle, your testosterone's going lower, not because you're eating a ketogenic diet, but because it's filling you up so much that you're so satiated that you naturally under eat. And therefore that's the thing hurting your hormones and hurting your thyroid is under eating. Yeah. I mean, I think any weight loss, I look, you look at, um, you know, the medically supervised 800 calories per day shake type diets. Oh yeah. They're wrecking their thyroids and their hormones and losing their hair. Right. But nobody's arguing or complaining about that, but it's, it's the same concept. Weight loss can do that, especially rapid weight loss. Um, and yeah, so I think you can definitely, it look, and there's some people that a ketogenic diet may not be right for, right? No question about it. Um, but I think the majority of the people who try it and feel good on it and will improve their health on it for the majority of people, but that's part of the individualization of nutrition and health. And when you said that the keto diet might not be right for everyone, what is that? How would someone know if it's right or wrong for them? Is it solely because of just like, like, um, it doesn't fit their lifestyle in terms of their social gatherings and vacations and travels, or is it because of they're having digestive issues? They can't handle all of that fat. There's other things aside from just like lifestyle and more actually with your um, biology. That's not yeah. okay. Yeah, both, both. Now, you know, when you look at an absolute contraindication to a keto diet, it's very, very slim. There are some people with just inborn um, genetic abnormalities where they cannot handle that much fat. But you're going to know that most people that's usually those are usually the conditions diagnosed in in childhood so uh, most people are going to know that but that's really the only absolute contraindication the rest are are you know relative contraindications meaning how do you feel how do your health markers change a ketogenic diet is a great treatment for high triglycerides but there I, i've seen a subset of people whose triglycerides skyrocket on a ketogenic diet but the majority of people are going to dramatically improve their, their triglycerides. So what is it about that one subset? And how do you know if you're in that subset? You try the diet and see what happens. I don't know how to predict that in any way. But, you know, so that's just one example that, that you know, not everybody responds the same, but the majority of the people respond beneficially. Do you think that diet is going to make the biggest impact on metabolic health? You said exercise initially. So then that really threw me off because I agree that for certain people, if they eat a high fat diet, their APOB goes up, they do a high carb diet, their APOB goes up. And so it seems to me that the thing that they need to be working on is their exercise to lower that APOB. Well, you put me in a tough spot because I think people need to improve their diet and their exercise. So I picked exercise because I, I, it is very important. Um, but like I said, if that's all you do, it's not enough. If diet's all you do, it might also not be enough, but it's a, it's certainly a good starting point. So doing the two together are a great combination. So I, I don't ever want my patients to pick one. I want my patients to pick both and which one they start with 
which one are they ready to start with, right? This is part of being a doctor. You got to know your patient. You got to know what's going to work, what's not going to work and, and how to help them. And for some people getting into the gym is a lot easier than changing everything you eat. And for some people it's completely vice versa. So depends on the individual. Which is completely, everybody's going to say like, oh, all he does is says it depends on the individual. Because it does, right? I'm so against like just saying there's one blanket statement for everybody. Like we need to treat people as individuals and figure out what works for individuals. Yep. I agree too. I've had people leave comments before saying that video wasn't helpful. All she did was tell me that I need to test it for myself. (laughs) I'm like, well, that's what you got to do. Yeah. I don't care what helps your neighbor get healthy. I care what helps you get healthy. Right. And so from, I think with diet and exercise, that's going to make the biggest, be the biggest movers. But then there's things like sleep, lowering your stress. Um, I'm not a huge cold shower person. It's just, I don't, I don't like being cold. I do more like sauna. I do the infrared. Are there any lifestyle hacks that you personally do aside from diet and exercise that you think help you with your metabolic health? Yeah. I mean, sleep and stress management, I think are the the big ones. I think the big rocks you got to do first are nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stress management. Once you hit f- those four and you're doing really well on those four, then you start thinking about however else you want to engage in healthy activities. But it's not going to help you if you're not doing those four. Right. And you talk a lot about how our food impacts our brain health and our depression, anxiety, OCD. Why yeah. is that? Why do what we eat yeah. impact our brain health, depression, anxiety, stress, all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And and I think there there are two main ways. And one is your metabolic health that affects your body affects your brain. There is a definite connection. Um, So improving metabolic health of your brain is going to improve your brain function and brain health overall. Now, the second part is that you can change the fuel of your brain. Ketones, your brain can run uh, up to 70% of your brain can run on ketones. And it's a more efficient fuel, especially if you have insulin resistance. So why do I use the term brain health? Well, because it can help with seizures, right? We've known for a hundred years that ketosis can improve seizures. It can help with cognitive decline. Ketogenic interventions can help with cognitive decline and dementia. And now we're learning that it can also help with psychiatric illnesses, whether it's bipolar disorder or uh, um, major depression or schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. So all of these different conditions have to do with brain function and brain health. And what you eat can impact all of them, both by improving metabolic health and by potentially changing the fuel, but also like how do you provide nutrition to your brain? Like all of these things are so crucial. So uh, Dr. Georgia E just came out with a book, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, I just did an interview with her on our um, Metabolic Mind YouTube channel. And this is exactly what she talks about. It's like, you want to nourish your brain. You want to prevent providing toxins to your brain, which seed oils are a big part of in her book. That is how you can improve brain health by just changing what you eat. I mean, it is it seems so simple, but yet something that's not really talked about enough. Um, we need to nourish our brain. We need to fuel our brain. If you're eating a diet that is worse for your metabolic health, that is worse for your blood sugar, that is worse for your insulin, yes, that's going to harm your body, your cardiovascular health, your endocrine system, your risk for cancer, and it's going to harm brain function and brain health overall. Avoid the processed foods, avoid the ultra processed packaged stuff, whether it's vegetable oils, whether it's sweets, whether it's um, you know organic whole grain processed crackers with a bunch of junk in them, but it's got the terms organic and whole grain on it. So it looks healthy. No, no, that's still not healthy. You know, with the information we're presenting about the connection between metabolic health and mental health and how ketogenic therapies can treat mental illness, you know, a pushback we get is, well, you know, someone suffered abuse as a kid and that helped, you know, that sort of led to their psychiatric diagnosis, you can't tell me that changing the way you eat gets rid of that trauma. Of course not. Like, no, it's not that there's one thing that keto ketosis solves everything. Absolutely not. Like it's part of the process. So if there's trauma to work through, you still need to work through that trauma. Ketosis doesn't change that. But what ketosis can do is change the fuel of your brain, improve the metabolic health of your brain, decrease the inflammation of your brain, help your neurotransmitters be more imbalanced, right? All those things can happen from ketosis. 
but it's not like it is the one salvation for everything that causes um, or leads to or contributes to mental illness. And the same for cardiovascular disease. Absolutely not. It's not going to fix everything that contributes to cardiovascular disease. And, and same thing for improving metabolic health. It's not going to fix everything, but it's the big rocks. It's going to be what's take care of a lot of it. But everybody's going to find, oh, but what about this one thing? It doesn't take, no, it doesn't solve everything. And, and we wouldn't expect it to, but it's a good place to start. Well, I'm that person too who has the childhood trauma and I eat the clean, healthy diet on paper. I'm doing the exercise. I'm doing the sauna and the red light therapy. I'm doing all the little things as well on top of the bigger picture stuff. But I, my cortisol is high because <laughs> I, I'm that person who constantly needs to be go, go, go and moving and grooving. So like, yes, tell me to work on my stress management, but I try to do that. And I'm like, okay, I'll do the, the gratitude journal. Okay. I'll try to like breathe, except for that's the hardest thing for me to do. But, um, even though I'm doing all the healthy right things, the stress part of it is definitely the thing that's gonna slowly kill me. And I've talked to somebody else who was more, they weren't a cardiologist, but they were more specializing in the heart as a, as a chiropractor. And he was saying th that people could definitely just give themselves a heart attack from just stress alone. Yeah, high stress definitely contributes to heart attack. Now, but stress is so important, right? You have a deadline tomorrow, you have a test to study for, or, you know, the, Tiger's chasing you analogy. You need stress. You want your heart rate to go up. You want your cortisol to go up. But then when that stress is over, you want it to come right back down. It's the society that we live in that we're worried about our mortgage and we're worried about our kids and we're worried about our job. And we're even worried about like what color the chairs are. You know, when those types of things like drive your stress, then you're stressed all day long and you're stuck in traffic. And that's where the, that's where the stress gets you. You can find Dr. Brett Schur's website, lowcarbcardiologist.com and social media handles in the video description. Don't be silly, subscribe to Lily, and I'll see you in the next one.